Well, we are here. Amen, Brother Ron, we are here. Don't you just hate it? You ever heard, you ever gone to a church or turned it on TV and they read, they read one scripture and they talked for 30 minutes that had nothing to do with that one scripture they read? Yeah. Like, what? What? That was, that was a nice speech you gave, but it wasn't really biblical. You kind of made some references to God or about God, but it was just cute. <laughs> we're not into cute here. We're into the actual what the Bible says. Is that okay? Jade says it's okay, so we're good. All right. What does the Holy Spirit do? Now, the Holy Spirit does a lot of things. I don't even know how many things he does. But today we're going to look at nine specific things, and then I'm going to throw two extra freebies in there afterwards at the end. But there's more than nine or even 11 things that the Holy Spirit does. He does a lot of things. Yeah. Do whatever he, the Father wants him to do and sends him to do. But there's nine primary things and functions uh, that the Holy Spirit was sent to the earth inside of us to do and accomplish and to help us do. And we're going to look at that. You ready? So we're going to have to go kind of quick because we've got nine things to write down. On the back of the pew in front of you, there's a little, little pamphlet there, a little uh, sermon note sheet. There's a pen there. there. Your little cheat sheet. You can get it out. You can get a pen. You can take some notes because you're not going to remember all nine of these things. Isn't that right? Unless your brother Ronnie, he probably remember all nine. But the rest of us, we're going to need the Holy Spirit to remind us of the nine things he does. All right, first thing, number one that the Holy Spirit does, the Holy Spirit convicts. Holy Spirit convicts. Do you know sinners don't get saved without conviction? I got three people. It's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that right? The Bible says, No man cometh to the Father, God, except through Jesus Christ. Can't get to God the Father except through Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the door. No man cometh to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? But the Bible goes on to say that no man can come to Jesus except he be drawn by the Holy Spirit and convicted. Isn't that good? John 16, 8, says, And when he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, we probably spend a whole sermon just on those three things, but we're not. We're going to go fast here. He convicts us of sin so that we will repent and be saved. Amen. He convicts us uh, of righteousness because the only, G, the, God said there is none righteous, no, not even one, outside of Jesus Christ. But now that we're saved, we are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. So when God sees us, he sees us as righteous. We don't see ourselves that way, but the Holy Spirit convicts us. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, even though we're looking in the mirror and we see a stinker. God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, is a righteous child of God. That's blood bought and blood covered. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So he convicts us sometimes of our righteousness, and we need some righteousness conviction. That's who I am. I am the righteousness of God. I'm right with God. I need to act like it and live like it and talk like it and treat people like it. Yeah. And he convicts the world of judgment because the, the, our sins, the Savior of the world took off our sins, and it was judged on that cross of Calvary. Come on, somebody. And he, he became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. He nailed our sins to that cross through his body and put it to death to satisfy the demands of the Father for the forgiveness of sins. That's our scapegoat. Jesus was and is. And there's, I mean, that's a whole deep thing. That's just a little shotgun uh, of it. But there it is. The Holy Spirit is the convictor. Now look at your neighbor and say, you're not. So stop. <laughs> We try so hard to help the Holy Spirit, Brother Ronnie, and help people feel convicted. <laughs> but really it turns into condemnation, doesn't it? And judgment, and it gets us in trouble. The Holy Spirit is the convictor. Let him do his job. All right, let's look at the difference between uh, conviction and condemnation because there is a difference. Uh, we think there's similarities, but there's really not. They're totally different. The Bible tells us that God did not send his son Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So Jesus come to save us, not to condemn us. Isn't that right? So if God did not send Jesus to condemn the world, then he sure enough didn't raise us up to condemn the world and those around us. In fact, Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Isn't that right? No condemnation. 
So let's look at the difference here. We need to be convicted but not condemned. We need to let the Holy Spirit convict people, and we need to quit condemning people. The word convict means to make aware of wrongdoing. That's what the Holy Spirit does when he convicts us. He makes us aware of a wrongdoing. He makes us aware uh, that's sin. How does he do it? Uh, you, you shouldn't have said that. that. We probably hear that from the Holy Spirit a lot, don't we? Some of you are wondering if you ever hear the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Uh, when you say something you shouldn't and you feel uh, convicted about it, uh, you're hearing the Holy Spirit. Because he's the one. He's not beating you up. He's not condemning you. He's not judging you. He's letting you know you shouldn't have said that. Uh, you shouldn't have screamed. Uh, you, shouldn't have, you shouldn't have cussed. You shouldn't have raised your voice. You, you, you shouldn't have treated them like that. He's checking you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He checks us. He convicts us. Isn't that good? That's what, he, what he's sent to do, to help us. He's in us to help us from the inside out not be the stinker that we are, but to be the Christ-like believer that we're becoming through Jesus Christ. He's here to help us into Christ's likeness because that's the goal of Christianity is to become like Christ in us. So to convict is to make aware of wrongdoing. The Holy Spirit's very good at doing that. It's conviction. Conviction. Uh, to condemn is to criticize or judge. In our common day uh, English language, we, we call it to put down or to belittle. <clears throat> We're really good at that. Uh, something we're just born with. We don't have to be taught how to condemn people, how to criticize or judge people. It just comes natural to our flesh, doesn't it? Isn't it natural? You ever seen a, 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 a toddler as they're beginning to learn uh, and, and discover things? Uh, they discover their will uh, somewhere when they're two years old. They've discovered that they have a will. And they're not just going along with the program anymore like they have been, but they begin to, to get selfish. And they say, they, le they learn pretty quick, mine. And they don't want to share it. They won't give it to you. They haven't really learned the word no. Uh, they begin learning it at two, but it seems like we have a problem with that word no uh, our whole life, don't we? We got a two-year-old grandson, and, and we're trying to get him to get grasp no. You better get this because you're going to need this your whole life, and you're never going to like it even when you're my age. You're still not going to like the word no, but you better get real used to it. No. To criticize our judge is to condemn. The Bible tells us, judge not that you be not judged. In fact, the Bible tells us we need to be merciful. Blessed are the merciful. Isn't that what the Bible says? Blessed are the merciful. In fact, the Bible tells us that to the measure that we judge others or extend mercy is the same measure it's going to be dealt back to us, both judgment and mercy. So we need to be pretty merciful people, don't we? Because that's what we're going to get. You reap what you sow. You sow judgment. You're going to get judgment. You sow mercy. You're going to reap mercy. So uh, be merciful. We need to quit condemning people and judging people and belittling people and putting people down um, and just let the Holy Spirit convict them. Are they wrong? Absolutely. That's never the question. Are they wrong? Are we wrong? Absolutely. That's why the Holy Spirit is here to convict us. So don't be a condemner or a convictor. Just be. Amen? Just be. Because you got your own issues. All right, the purpose of conviction is to bring repentance. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Bible tells us that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance because he loves us. It provides for us. Conviction provides for us an opportunity to change. Isn't that good? And since the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, he convicts us, not just what we did wrong, but convicts us with the truth. And the truth demands change. It just does. That's why the world doesn't like the truth. Darkness comprehended the light, and they, they chose the darkness. They didn't like the light. It exposed their darkness. They didn't like it. They don't like being called out. That's why I don't like to hear the truth. They can't handle it. The purpose of condemnation is to bring guilt and punishment. Do you hear that? We condemn because we want them to feel guilty and we want them to be punished. That's the purpose of con Sounds like the accuser of the brethren, doesn't it? To bring about guilt and condemnation. Condemnation provides no hope, only consequences. 
And sometimes that's what we want in our heart for people that we don't like. We want them to have consequences, not mercy. That's not God's plan. Amen. I need a big amen right there. That's not God's plan for us. That's not Christ's likeness because God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, have the opportunity to the conviction of the Spirit to change and be saved. And since Jesus is in us and, 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 and our goal is to be Christ-like, then, then we're not to be condemners neither and judges and hoping everybody has consequences for their sins when we ourselves are wanting mercy. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it amazing we want mercy for us, but judgment for some others that we don't like? <laughs> We're hypocrites. We really are. We need, we need to become more Christ-like in that and be convicted of our rights. All right, convicts. The Holy Spirit comes and he convicts. Number two, the second thing he does is he guides. The Holy Spirit guides. John 16, 13, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. We're talking about what the Holy Spirit does today. He convicts us. He guides us. I like to say he is our tour guide in this thing we call life. We get born again. We accept Christ as a Savior, the Holy Spirit. Spirit of Christ comes into our heart, dwells in us to guide us into truth because he is the Spirit of truth. He guides us how to live for God and what we need to do for God while we're here. Amen. See, getting saved is not just a ticket to heaven. God's got a plan for you while you're here. He wants you to actually live for him. Not just by being good and being moral, but by doing the works of Jesus Christ to help others. It's a package deal. The Holy Spirit has helped to guide us. Guide is to lead, to lead the way. I mean, you know, we're supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit. To walk with the Spirit, be led by the Holy Spirit. That's being guided by Him. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of His own authority, but whatever He hears, that's from the Father, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. Because He guides us. Galatians 5.18 talks about being led of the Spirit or being led by the Spirit. Psalms chapter 23, the 23rd Psalm. Uh, verse 2 says, uh, our shepherd, talking about our great shepherd, the Lord, he leadeth me beside the still waters. That's the Holy Spirit doing the leading because he's here to guide you. He guides us beside the still waters, not, not the raging seas, but the still waters. The very next verse, uh, verse 3, tw Psalms 23, 3, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Holy Spirit guides us. He leads us into righteousness. He leads us into following God. He leads us into peace, even in the midst of war, because he's our guide. Thank God we got a tour guide in this life called the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, number three. We don't have time to get really in-depth into any of these because there's a whole lot more to all of them, but we're just going to kind of just give you, the, give you the short version and keep this thing moving, all right? Get the gist of it. The Holy Spirit, it, uh, it teaches Third thing he does is he teaches. He is our teacher. The Holy Spirit is the best teacher in the universe. Yes. He inspired all of the scripture, this thing we call the Bible. He knows it frontwards and backwards because he inspired men to write it, put it on their heart what to write. He's the one that reminded them of what to write down on the, the, some of them big, long stories of history. He brought it to their remembrance and, and inspired them what to put in it. So he, of all, of all people in there, is the one to be able to teach us the truth what the Bible means by what it says. John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, see helper, that's another one. I didn't even put that down as one of my nine, the helper. <laughs> he is our helper. That's one of the biggest things he does. He helps us. All these things he does is helping us. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, the name of Jesus, he will teach you all things about God, how to live for God, how to live your life, and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. 1 Corinthians 2.13, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the Holy Spirit is our great teacher, our spiritual teacher. He teaches us the truth 
of God's scripture because he knows it. He's the spirit of truth. That's who he is. All right, number four. The Holy Spirit declares the things of God to us. He declares. John 16, verses 13 to 15. However, when he, say he, not it. He, the Holy Spirit of truth, has come. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own, own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, Jesus, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, Jesus said. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit declares things to us. He makes declarations. The word declare means to show. So the Holy Spirit shows us things, the things of Jesus Christ and how to live for Jesus Christ and what we're to do for Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit's the one that shows you that. This is what you need to do. I'm showing it to you, declaring it to you. Well, what would Jesus do? He's going to show you what Jesus would do and what Jesus wants to do in you now to other people. Amen? Amen. All right, number five. The Holy Spirit reminds us. I don't know about you. I'm a post-it note kind of guy. Thank God for the one who invented post-it notes. I'd be a mess without post I'm a mess anyway. I'd be a bigger mess without post-it notes. I learned in my early 20s that if I don't write it down, it's probably not getting done. <laughs> Whoever come up with to-do list, uh, they did it for me, people like me. Anybody else here need to-do list? Everybody else, y'all just say la vie, la vie, whatever will be, will be. No, I have to write it down. I, write, I mean, on trash days, I don't have trash that comes to my house. I have to take it to a collection site. I, have, I write down trash because I have gone many a Saturdays, including the last one, the last two, and I miss trash day. It's 90-something degrees outside. I've got four or five bags of trash by Saturday that need to get to that trash collection because they're closed Sunday and they're closed Monday. That means it ain't getting there till Tuesday. And if I've already got four or five on Saturday that Dean forgot about, whew, oh, it's pretty ripe come Thursday, Tuesday. Got one word for you, maggots. That's all I'm just going to say about it. That's all I'm going to say about it. You got to wear gloves and hope you don't puke. But so that little post-it note that says trash, I'm getting back to. I did yesterday. It reminded me yesterday. Take it. Because the two before, you forgot. The Holy Spirit, like a post-it note, he reminds us. <laughs> but the helper, John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Thank the Lord. The Holy Spirit reminds us. He reminds us what Jesus said to us. The Bible tells us in another part, if, you, if someone takes you to court, don't, don't prepare your big speech. The enemy's out to get you. When you get up there, the Holy Spirit's going to give you the words to say. You need to tune in. If you want to pray, tune in and listen to him. Pray that you can hear him. As he said, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say in that, in that moment. And he will remind us. Sometimes he reminds us to shut our mouth. <laughs> Amen. Anybody, some, sometimes me, you know, somebody cuts you off and it really upsets you. Because it's, it's disturbing when there is just a mile of road ahead of you with no cars and somebody gets around you. And they just think they only need to be one foot in front of your bumper before they get back in your lane. That's not very um, exciting when you're doing 70 miles an hour, isn't that right? And we have adjectives for stuff like that. A whole lot of them. And they're not all holy. Isn't that amazing? But the Holy Spirit will remind us and convict us of our righteousness when our flesh, yeah, temperature's going up, our blood pressure just shot up 20 points because they almost took our front bumper off when they got a whole mile to get ahead of us. And I'm not talking about in a... A, a, a two-lane road where, where they're in oncoming traffic. I'm talking about on the highway where they can stay in that lane. Don't take people's front bumpers off if that's you. <laughs> 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 or 
or writing bumpers, that kind of falls into the same category. Sometimes I just let off the gas and I just coast. And I'll get all the way down to 45 miles an hour. And Anna's like, stop it. Stop. I know they're eventually going to go around me. She's reminding me. Don't do that. <laughs> Holy Spirit is our reminder. He reminds us what the word says. It's like today. He reminded me of Devonie's name. Come up and said, hi, good morning. You forgot my name, didn't you? Said, yep. But give me a second. Once I got the alphabet right, Revelation eventually came. I remembered. Devonie. Number six, the Holy Spirit reveals. In that good, the Holy Spirit is our revealer. He, he brings revelation. He brings insight. Sheds light on things. Part of being his teacher. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10. As it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We can't even grasp. Can't even fathom. Because God is so good, the things he has prepared for us because we love him. Your brain's not going to figure it out. It's better than you can imagine. Heaven is going to be better than you can even possibly Best dream you can come up with is better than that. But God, verse 10, the things here on earth, not necessarily heaven, God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Holy Spirit's the revealer. For the spirit, Holy Spirit, searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit is the only one who knows perfectly the will of Father God. Because the Bible says he, the Holy Spirit, searches the heart and the mind of God so that he can tell us and guide us into the will of God, the Father. He's the one who searches it and finds it, knows how to translate that into our language so we can halfway grasp it. Isn't that good? So the Holy Spirit reveals things to us. We need revelation when we read the word of God. What does it mean? He's the one that reveals that to you if you listen. So let's get spiritual. Spiritual. <laughs> so we can hear the Holy Spirit. All right, number seven, he convicts. Did I say convicts? He comforts. That's a 55-year-old not using reading glasses. Conviction looks like comfort. He comforts. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. I'm going to go to the King James on this. John 14, 16. I will pray the Father. He will give you another comforter. That he may abide with you forever. Holy Spirit is our comforter. Verse John 15, 26, the very next chapter. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. So the Holy Spirit is our comforter. The Bible tells us in Corinthians that God is the God of all comfort. And he comforts us in all of our tribulation. That any trouble we, that we go through will not only be comforted, but it goes on to say, but that we may comfort others with that same comfort that God comforts us with. Because that's what we're to do. Share God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's mercy, God's comfort. We're to pass it on, pay it forward. And you got the great Holy Spirit in you comforting you so that you can help comfort others through what they're going through because you've probably been through it maybe already. You know, free funerals, diseases, sicknesses, we all experience those throughout our life. Pain. We all experience pain at different stages in our life. And the Holy Spirit helps us if we let him. He helps us through that pain. God didn't say we wouldn't go through the fire. He said he'd go through it with us. All right? In fact, he said, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, they're going to suffer persecution. Jesus himself suffered great persecution. He said, so likewise will we. But he'll be there with us to comfort us through it. And he wants us to, to do that to the best of our ability with others around, our brothers and sisters, to help, to help one another, comfort one another. Some of us have lost loved ones tragically wasn't just grandma passing away at the end of her life but we've lost people babies and kids and teenagers and young adults in our life through accidents and horrible murders and different different things we've lost loved ones and it is hurt it hurts it brings us great pain and grief in our hearts 
It's hard. It's hard to go through that stuff. One of the hardest things in life is to deal with loss of uh, untimely death of a loved one. But most of us experience that or will, and it's an unfortunate part of life. But it happens, and it hurts, and it's hard. And there's just not usually the right words to even say. And we learned that because you get told things that you wish you didn't even... Just stop. Just stop. Don't talk. Just be here, right? Right? Just be in the room. But don't, don't talk too much. I don't need to need a speech right now. Just need to know you care. So empathy, empathy is just caring. And sometimes that's all we need. And we learned that. And we need to pass that forward and share it with others. I heard a preacher one time at a, at a funeral of my cousin who committed suicide at 51 years old, just like I was talking about. The pastor there lost his wife, 40-something years old, to cancer. And he was very angry when he went through that situation, when people come up and say, oh, she's in a better place. He's like, stop, don't, don't, just, just shush. Don't tell me she's in a better place. She's 40 years old. I'm still raising the kids that we were raising together. I don't want to hear she's in a better place. I want to hear right now. If that's selfish, then I'm being selfish, but I want to hear. Don't tell me she's in a better place. I want to hear. Shush, stop. Right? It's insensitive. Sometimes we talk too much, and it becomes insensitive to what we tell people. Just give me a hug. Tell me you love me and you're praying for me. That's all I need. Just be. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He's the one that gives us comfort. And he gives it to us to help us. But he's also in us. And we've gone through these painful situations. And now God can use that for us to help others find comfort from him when they're hurting. It's hard to find comfort when you're hurting, but it's there. It may take time. Pain doesn't just go away. You know, when, you, when you've lost a, a, a child, doesn't matter how old they are, they went before you, it hurts. And I've known, even in my own family, have known people that's gone through that, and they've grieved for a little bit, and after the funeral, and maybe a week or two or, or a month, uh, I've heard other people tell them, uh, you need to move on. That's pretty insensitive. You don't tell me when I need to quit grieving. Grieving's a process. There's five stages of grief, and sometimes you go back through them and you start over. And go through, it's not up to you to tell me when I need to quit grieving for my child that's gone. So stop. Quit telling me that I need to get back to work and I need, to, I need to, uh, to, to get back to normal life and I just need to get over it. That's not comfort. Amen? That's condemnation. You need to quit it. You need to move on. No, I don't need to move on. Weep with those who weep. You know what your Bible says? Mourn with those who mourn. Rejoice with those who rejoice. But we're to share the comfort of the Holy Spirit um, that he shares with us. All right, number eight. The, I'm just trying to help you. Holy Spirit anoints. Say anoints. Holy Spirit anoints. He is the anointer because he, the Holy Spirit, is the power of God. That's who he is. Acts 10.38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost... And with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. The word anoint means he enables or empowers. God in, I mean, there's, there's different meanings of it because you can anoint things with oil. Also mean kind of an appointing thing. But in this spiritual sense here, it is uh, the enabling, the empowering of the Holy Spirit on one's life to do the works of Christ. That's what the anointing is. It's the power of God on you. You're receiving the empowerment of God on you to do works on his behalf. How I many you know we need the anointing? We need to be anointed, empowered. That's why the Holy Spirit comes. to On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He said, you're going to receive the promise of the Father. And when you do, you're going to receive power to be witnesses for God everywhere you go. So one of the Holy Spirit's purposes is to come anoint us and enable us and empower us to do the works of God while we're here on the earth. 
we shall receive power, the anointing, when the Holy Spirit uh, comes upon us. Remember in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus opened the scriptures in Isaiah, and he read it and he said, The Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, is on me. Why? Because he has anointed me, empowered me. Why? And then it goes on and lists six things about helping uh, people get delivered and, and saved and, and their hearts healed and their brokenness, their souls mended, heal the brokenhearted, blind eyes, remember all that stuff? The anointing. He said, the Holy Spirit's on me to anoint me to set people free, to minister to them. We're empowered to do that by the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we, we see the gifts of the Spirit, the nine gifts of the Spirit, but it takes the power of the Holy Spirit for those to work. Isn't that right? Not just some gift we get and we just do. It's the power. The power of God is the Holy Spirit of God. He is the power that's in God and of God. In fact, Romans chapter 8 tells us that if the same Holy Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead, because he's the power of God that gave him life, put life back in that body, put his spirit back in that body. That same spirit dwells in you, then he shall quicken, make alive your mortal body, empower you, the same that he did Jesus Christ. All right, and then last of all, number nine, the Holy Spirit fellowships. He's sent here to fellowship with us. We've looked at that several times through this series. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, that grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus come to bring us grace, for you're saved by grace, through faith, it's a gift of God. It's not earned. It's a free gift. And the love of God the Father, God so loved the world, he gave Jesus grace to get us to heaven. And the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, amen. I believe that was the first week we did it. The word communion there has seven different meanings to it. One of them and, and probably the most significant one is fellowship. The Holy Spirit is in here to fellowship with us, to commune with us, to, to be with us, to talk with us. The old hymn says, and he walks with me. That's the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And he talks with me. Holy Spirit. He's the, when you hear the voice of God, you're hearing the Holy Spirit. He's walking with you. He's talking with you. He's fellowshipping with you. He's your friend. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants or slaves, but I now call you friends. I'm a friend of God. Tell your neighbor, I'm a friend of God. God's not just a distant deity. He's not just a God in heaven. He's very present help through the Holy Spirit right here, right now. Sometimes we need to remember who we are when we're talking with people who don't know God and say, you know what? I know God. God. Ooh. I know him, not just about him. Not just from the words of a book we call the Bible in heaven. I believe that. No, I know the God of the Bible. That's the difference. Is not just knowing about him, Mike, but knowing him personally. So many people on TV, they say, I have a personal relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, you have that through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that right? We do have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ and heirs of God. Christ's likeness is our goal. The Holy Spirit's the one that helps us do all of that, helps us talk to the Father, helps us pray through fellowshipping with him, hanging out with him. When's the last time you just hung out with the Holy Spirit? He's in me. I told you a couple weeks ago, sometimes when, when my mind gets it and I really grasp it and I'm kind of wrapping my prayer up for the morning and the day and I'm ready to go, I said, all right, Holy Spirit, let's do this. Let's go. What are we going to do today? Let's do it. Let's go. Because he walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. All right, we can get the worship team to come. There's a few additional things. We're not going to put them on the screen. Just a couple more things the Holy Spirit does. I mean, he does a lot of things. But uh, one thing is he, he bears witness to us. Remember that one? How do we know we're saved? Because the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God, heirs of God. 
That's Romans 8, 16. He bears witness. Another thing the Holy Spirit does is he intercedes for us. That's in Romans 8, 26. Jesus does too. The Bible says Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, and he ever lived to make an intercession for us. He's praying. Jesus is praying for you. And that's good to know. That's good to know. But the Bible also says the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. He talks to the Father for us on our behalf. That's, that's pretty good. That's, that's, that's a good connection. Think about that. That's a, that's a pretty good connection. In fact, sometimes when I get that, because I don't always, you know, process that out, but sometimes when I process that and I'm frustrated in my prayer, I'll, I'll ask the Holy Spirit, I'll say, hey, can you do me a favor? Holy Spirit, I need you to do me a favor today. Will you put in a good word for me with, with the Father? I don't feel like I'm getting through sometimes. Maybe I'm not under, understanding. Maybe I'm not saying it right. Maybe I'm not praying it right. Maybe it's something I'm not getting, but hey, do me a favor. Put in a good word for me today with the Father. Tell him what, in, in your language, what I'm trying to say, in my language, that maybe it's just... And if, and if that's not it then tell me in my language, because I'm, you know, I'm not all there. A little different. Tell me what he's trying to tell me in my own simple, you know, Bible for dummies, I guess, for me. Put it where I can understand. If you got to slap, slap, do whatever you got to do. Put it in my language where I can get it, because I really want to do the will of the Father, but I need to get it. So help me get it. So you talk to him and then have a talk back with me and help me figure this thing out. All right, will you stand today? Holy Spirit does so many things, but bottom line is he's here to help you by living in you. Will you let him? Because everything the Holy Spirit does, you have to yield to and you have to let him do it. Because we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can resist the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us. We can ignore him. We have the choice to do that. He doesn't make us and force us. He doesn't. Possess us. Oh, let him do it. Come on. Let him do it. He's wonderful. I would rather be